Hello Algebra 1's, here's your video for simplifying and evaluating expressions and we're going to look at numerical expressions and algebraic expressions. Let's jump right in with starting to talk about the order of operations. Order of operations. The problem with order of operations that we have is it's taught completely out of context. So let me give you a little bit of context for your order of operations and let's start with what the heck is the order of operations. The order of operations is usually represented by this old tired acronym, PEMDAS. Usually, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, I prefer purple elephants may destroy a school, but that's just me. And it tells us that we're supposed to do our math in this order. First, what's inside parentheses, then any exponents we need to um, apply, then multiplication and division as it comes from left to right, and addition and subtraction as it comes from left to right. But what really is the point of that? Well, let me show you. The point of the order of operations is that we learn how to apply it in an algebraic expression. So if I was to evaluate this expression, which we're not going to do in this circumstance, but if I knew what the value of x was, the way that I would actually do the math here, or evaluate this expression, is I would start by squaring that value of x. Then I would multiply that value of x times this 8. Then I would do the subtraction and then the addition as it comes across from left to right. And that's the point of order of operations. It's not one of these numerical expressions they throw at you that you have to simplify. It's actually realizing that in this circumstance, PEMDAS has to apply because that's how we do the math correctly. Rather than only giving you these long, drawn-out, seemingly pointless numerical expressions to simplify using the order of operations, which, of course, we will still do because it's something you still need to be able to do, it's important to recognize why we learn this skill, because we have to apply it to the algebraic expression. All right, moving on to what makes like terms. Okay, in an algebraic expression, what exactly is it that makes terms like terms? Well, like terms have the same variable with the same exponent. So to be alike, two terms must have the same variable with the same exponent. Let's look at some examples. Here we have two algebraic expressions. The first one on the left. Negative 5x, oop, 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 get my laser pointer instead of moving my, my images around. Negative 5x minus x plus 8 plus 6x minus 10. And in this algebraic expression, you have one pair of like terms. You have minus x and you have plus 6x. So, oh, I lied. There is actually another pair of like terms here. Does anybody notice what it is? It's plus 8 and minus 10. Now let's um, talk real quickly about some vocabulary. This one right here is your quadratic term. That's something that will come up later in the year, but it can't hurt to start with the vocabulary. And these, both of these here would be linear terms. And that's something we'll talk about as we learn about more complicated equations. Finally, your 8 and your minus 10, those would be, we should remember this from last class, constants. So again, your like terms have the same variable and the same exponent. I cannot add together this negative 5x and this minus x, or subtract in this situation. I can't do that, because they're not like terms. This is x times itself, and this is just x. So they're definitely not the same value. I can't combine them the way I could combine a minus x and a plus 6x. Now please copy down the second example and identify those like terms for me and then uh, so pause your video to do so and see if you ended up with the correct answer. Alright, so your like terms should be the negative 3x squared and the x squared and the plus 2x and the plus 7x. What would be the name for that minus 4 there right in that in the middle of that expression? That's right, that would be a constant. Excellent. So that's what makes like terms. We're not going to see too much in the way of algebraic expressions. Let's take a look at simplifying a couple of expressions. First, looking at what makes the difference between simplify and evaluate. In order to simplify some expressions, we're going to first have to identify what the difference is here between simplify and evaluate. Simplify means do all the math you can until you can't do any more. So that's follow the rules of math until your answer is as simple as it gets. So we'll see in some cases that means your, your answer will be a number, a numerical answer, and in some cases it'll be an algebraic expression where you can't simplify it any further. Evaluate, on the other hand, means 
plug in the given variable values and find the numerical value of the expression. Let's look at a couple of examples of expressions that you can simplify. Here are four examples of expressions that you can simplify. So you can go through and simplify them on your own. The first one should have a value that ends up being negative 48, and the second one should have a value equal to 1. So because this is a prerequisite skill, a pre-algebra skill, I'm not going to go through those two on the video. But I will do the um, algebraic expressions because this is a little bit new. Again, probably a prerequisite skill. You probably did this last year, but let's just review quickly. So I have one pair of like terms here that are um, algebraic terms, n plus 9n. And if I have 1n and I add 9n, I have 10n. 10n. And then minus 10 and minus 3, those are also like terms, but they're constants. So minus 10 and minus 3 is like negative 10 and negative 3. That's negative or minus 13. So negative 13 or minus 13. So the simplified version of that expression is 10n minus 13. Negative 6k plus 7k is the last one here. We're adding the negative 6 plus 7 and then tacking the k back on. So negative 6 plus positive 7 is positive 1. So that will be 1k, but we don't need the 1, so we just say that's k. And that's the value of that expression. So we're going to move forward now. We're going to take a look at actually doing some um, um, evaluating of expressions. Here are the steps for evaluating algebraic expressions. You're going to start by copying the expression and the given variable values. Now I know that some of you are neglectful in how much you write out, but I think this is really important, especially if you're going back and forth between a workbook and a, and a, and a page, or, or a test screen for that matter, and a page. So I want you to copy the expression as it's shown and the given variable values. Second step, you're going to rewrite the expression, replacing the variables with those given values in the parentheses where it's and, and putting them in parentheses where it's necessary. So we're taking the expression instead of the variables, we're putting in the numbers. And quite often it's important to use parentheses. This is especially important when there are exponents involved and when the values that you're plugging in for your variables are negative. If you don't use those parentheses at that point, you will have a problem with your answer because your answer will not come out correctly in a lot of circumstances. The final step here is to use the order of operations to find the value of the expression. So we simplify all the way down, get a numerical value, and we're done. Let's try some expressions. Okay, here we have uh, six algebraic expressions that we are going to evaluate. So I'm going to give you some numbers for the variables at the top of the page, and I'm going to number the expressions, and we're going to go through and evaluate them. Okay. So there you go, you have six values and six expressions that involve these different variables as we go. Now I want you to note that I know you're looking at that and saying, oh, come on, Ms. LeCompte, really fractions? Yes, really, fractions. It's part of the SOL that we have to be able to um, evaluate expressions using rational numbers. So what I would really like you to do is I'm going to go through one at a time, each one, one, two, three, four, five, six. I want you to pause it. I want you to try number one. Once you have your answer, I want you to play your video again and take a look at the way that I've done the problem. So we have 5r plus 2d. So 5 times r, so we said in our, in our directions that we need to copy down the expression, which I hope you have done, and then plug the values in using parentheses where it's necessary. Well, we're going to use the parentheses here to show multiplication. So it's 5 times a half plus 2 times 5. When we have a whole number times a fraction, you know, I want you to remember that that whole number is really as if it's a whole number over 1. So really it's whole number times numerator. So we're going to get 5 times a half, which is 5 halves, plus 2 times 5, which is 10. Well, in order to add that, we're going to write that 10 as 20 halves. It really just makes sense. It's the easiest way to do that part. Instead of doing it separately um, and finding a common denominator, let's just write 10 as 20 over 2. That's the same value. So 5 halves and 20 halves makes 25 halves. Halves. And in algebra, we express our answers as improper fractions, not mixed numbers. That's um, for the SOL, and it's also for other concepts we're going to see throughout the year. Excellent. Try number two, please. And then um, you can start your video again and check out the answer. So this time we have six plus, so six plus five, and then in parentheses, we're going to plug in the y value, which is eight, 
plus the g value, which is negative 1. And I want you to notice that I'm putting that negative 1 in parentheses because it's necessary there to distinguish between the plus sign and the negative on the 1. So what do we get for that? Well, we're going to start from the inside out. 8 plus negative 1 is 7, bringing all the rest of the expression down. 5 times 7 is 35, bringing the rest of the expression down. Add those numbers together, 41. Excellent. Moving on to number 3. Number 3, b squared plus 3b minus 10. We're plugging in a negative here, so it's really important that we're careful about keeping the parentheses around that negative. So when we plug in the negative 2 for b, negative 2 the quantity squared is quite different from negative 2 squared without the parentheses. And it's really, really important that you guys make sure you are writing those parentheses around there, um, especially in this first example, so that you can be in that habit all the time. Plus 3 times the negative 2 for b and then minus 10. So negative 2 the quantity squared is positive 4, because negative 2 squared means negative 2 times itself. Negative 2 times negative 2, positive 4. Plus 3 times negative 2, so that's plus negative 6, and then minus 10. So 4 and negative 6 is negative 2, minus 10 is negative 12. Good, pause it please, try number 4, and you'll start it up again, and I'll go ahead and do it for you. So hopefully you have an answer for this one. So 3 times r, which is 1 half, plus 6, and the parentheses, and then minus d, which was 5. So 3 times a half, just like we had up here, 5 times a half, 3 times a half is going to be 3 halves. And then because we know, well, we're, you know, we're adding 3 halves to something, let's write that 6 as so many halves. How many halves is 6? Well, that's 12 halves. And then minus 5. So now I have... 3 halves plus 12 halves is 15 halves. And then again, because I am dealing with a fraction, why not write that 5 as 10 over 2? So 15 over 2 minus 10 over 2 gives us 5 over 2. And that's the final answer for number 4. We'll do the last two. I'll go ahead and go straight through and do 5 and 6 because they have the absolute value bars and the radical sign. That's a little bit different. So for number 5, we have the absolute value of 7 minus 2n. And our n value is 3 halves. So we have the absolute value of 7 minus 2. We're going to put in our 3 halves for n and the absolute value bars. So this is another great example of dealing with fractions that, that actually turns out easier than we think. That 2 is really a 2 over 1. And those 2's are going to cancel. Because in the rules of multiplying fractions, we know that when we have the same number diagonally, we can cancel them out. We can divide both of those 2's by 2, and we end up with 1 for each one, and so they cancel out. So I have the absolute value of 7 minus 3, and that's 4. The absolute value of 4 is just 4. All right, last one. We have the square root of 2y. So that's the square root of 2 times the y, and the y value here is 8. Outside the absolute value bars, we have minus 1 half for r, which I'm going to put in parentheses, and 5 for d. So that means I have the square root of 2 times 8, which is the square root of 16. So I'm going to go ahead and write that. And at the same time, I'm going to multiply that 1 half times that 5 and get 5 halves. I am completely out of space here. The square root of 16 is 4. So I'm just going to come all the way over to here. 4 minus 5 halves. Well, again, we're going to write that 4 as halves. So we're going to write that as 8 halves. 4 is the same thing as 8 halves minus 5 halves, and we end up with an answer of 3 halves. I'm going to circle it because I kind of ran out of some room there, so it got a little, little complicated there at the end. So now we've evaluated six algebraic expressions, and we're going to practice with this in class as well. And it's important that you remember what we talked about in the video about putting the value in parentheses, especially when it's negative, and the little tricks we talked about with the fractions here and here. All right, folks, you've done a good job. I know this video might be a little long tonight. So thank you for watching, and I will see you in class.